chapter twenty four of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain too late sylvia's journey was quiet and uneventful and her companion was tactfully silent leaving her at peace to think her own thoughts as time passed by the natural hopefulness of youth reasserted itself and she began to think that she had been too hasty in taking it for granted that her father was hopelessly ill after all he had not dispatched the telegram it had been signed by his friends the nisbets who no doubt were unwilling to accept a position of responsibility when she arrived she would nurse him so devotedly would surround him with such an atmosphere of love and care that he could not help recovering and growing strong once more he would be longing to see her poor dear old dad working himself into an invalid's nervous dread lest they might never meet again as she herself had done a few months earlier and the sight of his child would be his best medicine they left the train and took their places in the boat it was a cloudless summer afternoon and the white cliffs stood out in striking contrast to the blue sky and sea what a change from the big grey city which even now was beginning to grow close and dusty what a glorious open prospect for one who had been shut up for months in the confines of a narrow street and yet rutland road had been far more beautiful to one voyager at least for at that moment exactly that moment as timed by the little watch at her wrist jack o'shaughnessy would have turned the corner of the main road to saunter towards his own home jack always sauntered with the air of a gentleman at large who had never known the necessity of hurry sylvia had watched him many times from the shelter of her window curtains and knew exactly how he would carry his head and twirl his stick and glance rapidly across the road as he unlatched the gate pixie would open the door and breathlessly unfold the news with which she had by this time been made acquainted and how would jack look then would the smile fade away would he feel as if all zest and interest had departed from the evening entertainment or would he make the best of things in happy o'shaughnessy fashion and console himself in molly's smiles the breeze grew fresher and more chill and the stars began to peep the travellers had reached the shores of france and far away in london esmeralda's guests were beginning to arrive the carriages were jostling one another in the narrow street then came paris and a space for rest and refreshment before starting on the next stage of the journey sylvia had hoped that a telegram might be waiting for her at this point but none was forthcoming and its absence was a bitter disappointment despite the old adage that no news is good news she sat in the big deserted buffet drinking bouillon and eating poulet and salad and catching sight of her own pallid reflection in one of the mirrors smiled feebly at the contrast between the present and the might have been this white-faced weary-looking girl was surely not the sylvia trevor whose daydreams had woven such golden things about this very hour the lady courier engaged a sleeping compartment for the first stage of the long journey to marseilles but though it was a comfort to lie down and stretch her weary limbs there was little sleep for sylvia that night she was up and gazing out of the window by six o'clock in the morning and the day seemed endless despite the interest of the scenes through which she passed through thy cornfields green and sunny vines o pleasant land of france the lines which she had read in her youth came back to memory as the train crossed the broad waters of the loire and sped through valleys of grapes and olives surrounded by hills of smiling green the sun was hot in these southern plains 
and the dust blew in clouds through the windows it was a relief when evening fell again and brought the end of the long journey sylvia stepped on to the platform and looked around with eager gaze although she had never met her father's friends she knew their appearance sufficiently well from photographs and descriptions to be able to distinguish them from strangers but nowhere could she see either husband or wife it was unkind to leave her unwelcomed and with no word to allay her anxiety and she had hard work to keep back her tears as her companion ran about collecting the scattered pieces of luggage she was so tired mentally and physically that this last disappointment was too much for her endurance and she thanked god that in a few minutes the strain would be over and she would be seated by her father's side they drove along the quaint foreign streets and presently arrived at the hotel itself a large building set back in a courtyard in which visitors sat before little tables smoking and drinking their after-dinner coffee they looked up curiously as sylvia passed but no one came forward to meet her and the waiter gesticulated dumbly in answer to her questionings and led the way upstairs without vouchsafing a word in reply it was humiliating to think that her accent had so degenerated as to be unrecognizable in his ears but there was no other explanation and it was at least evident that she was expected since he seemed in no doubt as to where to conduct her first he turned down a corridor to the right stopped at the second door and threw it open and sylvia saw with surprise that it was not a bedroom but a sitting-room in which a lady and gentleman were already seated the gentleman leapt to his feet wheeled round and stood with his face to the window the lady shrank back into her chair then suddenly jumped up and ran forward with outstretched hands it was mrs nisbet though looking older and more worn than sylvia had expected to see her and nothing could have been kinder or more affectionate than her greeting my dear child my poor dear child how tired you must be you you've had an awful journey come in dear and rest a few minutes while i will make some tea for you english people always like tea don't they and i will make it myself so that it shall be good come dear sit down let me take off your hat she stroked the girl's cheek with her hand such a hot trembling hand and there was an odd excited thrill in her voice which filled sylvia with a vague alarm she stepped back a step and drew herself up straight and determined thank you very much but i don't want any tea i want to go at once to father it has been such a long long journey i mustn't waste any more time no no but you are not ready just this moment you must have something to strengthen you first if you don't wait for tea there is some wine drink a glass dear do to please me sylvia stared at her fixedly and from her to that other figure which stood motionless by the window without so much as a glance for his friend's child a cold fear seized her in its grip the room swam before her eyes and out of the confusion she heard a weak voice saying brokenly tell me quickly please it won't help me to drink wine father mrs nisbet burst into a passion of tears and clasped the girl tightly in her arms you are too late dear an hour too late we did everything we could he left you his last love and blessing it was all over the two long days of waiting the last glimpse of dad's still face the funeral in the foreign cemetery and sylvia sat alone in the hotel sitting-room striving to recover sufficiently from the shock to decide on the next step which lay before her in the crushing weight of the new sorrow it seemed as if it were impossible to go on living at all 
yet it was absolutely necessary to make her plans for she could not be an indefinite burden on her father's friends they had come home to enjoy a hard-earned rest and as the holiday had begun so sadly there was all the more reason why the remainder should be passed under cheerful conditions mr and mrs nisbet had pressed the girl to spend the next few months travelling in their company but sylvia was resolute in her refusal i should be a constant care to you and a constant killjoy and that would be a poor return for all you've done for me she said sadly it will comfort me all my life to remember that you were with dad during those last dreadful days and some day i should like very much to visit you when i can be a pleasure instead of a burden it does not seem now as if i could ever be happy again but i suppose it will come in time it will if you trust in god and ask him to help you he sends troubles to teach us lessons dear and to draw our thoughts to him but never never to make us miserable said mrs nisbet softly you did not feel that you had lost your father when he was far off in india and he is a great deal nearer to you now in the spirit world never think of him as in the grave think of him in heaven and it will grow dear and home-like to you just because he is there it would have grieved him to the heart to see your young life clouded so you must try to be happy for his sake i don't mean by that that you can be lively or care for the old amusements that can only come with time but unhappiness comes from rebellion against god's will and if you submit to that and leave your life in his hands you will find that all the sting has gone out of your trouble the slow tears rose and stood in sylvia's eyes thank you she said meekly i will try but it's hard to be resigned when one is young and all one's life seems shattered i don't know what to do next every arrangement so far has been made till dad comes home and now that hope is gone and what am i to do i have no home and no work and nobody needs me aunt margaret would take me in of course but she would not like it as a permanency any more than i should myself she has her own way and i have mine and we did not agree very well she was very kind when she thought i was going away but at the bottom of her heart she was glad she doesn't need me you see i don't help her at all but you could make her need you you could help her if you went back determined to make it your work in life mrs nisbet took the girl's hand in hers and pressed it gently and sylvia looked into her face with miserable honest eyes yes i could i could shut my lips up tight and never answer back and look interested when i was bored and go little walks up and down the terrace and play cribbage when i wanted to read and read aloud dull books when i wanted to read lively ones to myself and pretend to like what i really hate and detest poor lassie it does sound dull i'll tell you a secret though it would not be pretense very long for it is one of the blessed recompenses in life that if we conquer self and perform a duty wholeheartedly and cheerfully it is distasteful no longer but becomes more interesting than we could have believed possible in the old rebellious days does it but i don't think i quite want to be satisfied with that kind of life sylvia said slowly i don't wish to seem disrespectful but really and truly aunt margaret's ideas are terribly narrow and old-fashioned and i shouldn't like it a bit if i were like her when i was old i've managed pretty well so far for i had nice friends and was always looking forward to the time when i should have my own home but don't you understand how different it is now and how dreary it seems to settle down to it as a permanency she looked up wistfully in mrs nisbet's face and met a smile of kindest understanding 
but there is no necessity to grieve over the future child at your age arrangements are rarely permanent and you were concerned only with the next step it seems for the moment as if it were the right course to return to london so try to look upon the situation from a new standpoint and face it bravely forget your aunt's shortcomings and remember only that she is your father's only remaining relative the playmate and companion of his youth and that you are connected by a common sorrow and a common loss set yourself to brighten her life and to fill it with wider interests forget yourself in short and think about other people when you have learned that lesson dear you will have solved the great secret of life and found the key to happiness and peace of mind yes sighed sylvia faintly it sounded very sweet and very beautiful but oh so terribly difficult to accomplish if it had been a big thing one great heroic sacrifice which she was called upon to make she could have braced herself to the effort and have borne it with courage but the little daily pinpricks the chafings of temper the weariness of uncongenial companionship these were the hardest test the most cruel tax upon endurance day after day week after week month after month the same uneventful monotonous existence and suppose for one moment that jack married molly burrell and bridgie returned to her irish home sylvia shivered and shut her eyes as at an unbearable prospect and mrs nisbet's voice said softly in her ear i do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me take each day as it comes dear and try to live it bravely without thinking of to-morrow we will travel with you as far as paris and have a few days together before you go on to london i wish you would have stayed with us longer but perhaps it will be better for us all to be apart for a time and meet again later on we shall be in london in autumn and one of my first visits will be to you your father has been like a brother to my husband for years past and we shall always feel a very close interest in your welfare by the way dear how are you off for money would it be a convenience if i lent you some to pay for mourning and the return journey you came away expecting to be responsible for a few days only and as you know when a man dies it is not possible to touch his money until certain legal formalities have been observed we should be only too delighted to act as your bankers until matters are settled thank you very much but i think i shall have enough i drew out what money was in the bank before leaving home and i would rather not get into debt until i know exactly how i am placed there may be very little left father always spoke as if he were poor he told you nothing about his affairs then you know nothing about them mrs nisbet looked at her curiously as she spoke and sylvia's heart gave a throb of fear she knew something there was evidently some secret with which she herself was unacquainted and in her present depressed condition of mind and body it was only natural that she should leap to the conclusion that the news must be bad and ostrich-like tried to hide her head in the sand he told me there had been some changes lately which i should not understand his lawyers will write to me some time i suppose but i don't want to think about money yet i have sufficient for the next few months for i shall go nowhere and need no more clothes yes yes dear it's all right you will get along nicely i'm sure said the other soothingly and sylvia felt another thrill of foreboding get along nicely did that mean she would have to earn her own living she dared not inquire further shrinking from the possibility of another blow but it was impossible to keep from wondering what she should do if indeed there was no provision for her support pixie's adventures in search of employment had proved how difficult it was for an inexperienced girl to escape becoming the prey of fraudulent advertisements 
and it was humiliating to reflect on her own incapacity what could she do that a thousand other girls could not accomplish equally well she could play fairly well sing fairly well paint fairly well trim a hat so that it did not look obviously home-made make a trifle or creams though she was densely ignorant about boiling a potato she possessed in fact a smattering of many things but had not really mastered one which if needs be would be a staff through life a hundred poor girls find themselves in this position every year yet their short-sighted sisters continue to fritter away their time oblivious of the fact that to them also may come the rainy day when they must face the world alone learn to do one thing well compare your productions whatever they may be not with those of other amateurs but with perfected professional specimens and do not be content until your own reach the same standard this is a golden rule which every girl ought to take to heart during the ten days which elapsed before sylvia's return to london she was haunted by the fear of monetary troubles which would make her either dependent on her own efforts or a burden upon her aunt's narrow income but neither mrs nisbet nor her husband referred again to the subject and some time must still elapse before she could hear from her father's lawyer in colombo the week in paris passed away quietly but more pleasantly than she could have believed possible under the circumstances for nothing could have been kinder or more considerate than the way in which she was treated by her father's friends while the brilliant sunshine acted as a tonic to the spirits every day they went long drives in the bois or took the train to versailles and spent long quiet hours in the woods and sylvia even found herself able to enjoy a visit to one of the huge magasins where mrs nisbet invested in quite a collection of presents to send home to english friends sylvia was tempted to buy some on her own account and it was a new and depressing experience to feel that she must not spend an unnecessary penny her little hoard was diminishing rapidly and she was growing more and more anxious to be safest home and free from at least immediate anxiety there was no lady courier to accompany her on this journey for the days of independence had begun and she preferred to be alone to wrestle with her forebodings and try to bring herself into a fitting frame of mind for that trying return to the old scenes the parting from the nisbets was like saying good-bye once more to the dear dad and she felt hopelessly adrift without their wise and tender counsels and the feeling of loneliness grew ever deeper and deeper as she approached the english shores the great shock through which she had passed had loosened all the ties in life and made the friends of a few weeks ago seem but the merest of acquaintances bridgie had written the sweetest of sympathetic letters but sorry though she might be the force of circumstances kept the two girls so far apart that what had been the saddest time in her friend's life had seen the climax of her own gaiety she had been dancing and singing and pleasure-making while sylvia shed the bitter tears of bereavement and in a few weeks more she would be spirited off in esmeralda's train to another scene of gaiety the o'shaughnessys were by nature so light of heart that they might not care to welcome among them a black-robed figure of grief sylvia felt as though the whole wide world yawned between her and the old interests and did not yet realize that this feeling of aloofness from the world and its interests is one of the invariable accompaniments of grief she was young and not given to serious reflection and she knew only that she was tired and miserable that the white cliffs about which she had been accustomed to speak with patriotic fervour looked bleak and cheerless in the light of a wet and chilly evening june though it was she was glad to wrap herself in her cloak and pull her umbrella over her head as she passed down the gangway on to the stage in paris it had been a glorious summer day and the change to wet and gloom seemed typical of the homecoming before her 
the cloaked and mackintoshed figures on the stage seemed all black all the same she would not look at them lest their presence should make her realize more keenly her own loneliness but someone came up beside her as she struggled through the crowd and forcibly lifted the bag from her hand she turned in alarm and saw a man's tall figure lifted her eyes and felt her troubles and anxieties drop from her like a cloak it was jack o'shaughnessy himself End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a comforter think of it think of it the grey inhospitable skies the rain-swept stage the feeling of hopeless loneliness as one traveller after another was greeted with loving exclamations and borne away by friendly watchers and then suddenly to feel your hand grasped and laid tenderly on a protecting arm and to see looking into your own face the face of all others which you would have wished for had the choice been given to feel no longer a helpless unit belonging to no one and having no corner of the earth to call your own but to know that some one had watched for your arrival and to read how you had been missed in the flash of eloquent eyes oh jack cried sylvia involuntarily oh jack and clung to his arms with a sob of pure joy and thanksgiving oh i am so glad i was so lonely how did you whatever made you come a great many reasons but principally because i couldn't stay away replied jack not smiling as was his wont but looking down upon her with an intent scrutiny which aroused sylvia's curiosity she did not realize how changed she was by the experience of the last few weeks or what a pathetic little face it was which looked up at him between the dead black of hat and cape the brown eyes looked bigger than ever the delicate aquiline of the features showed all the more distinctly for their sharpened pallor and jack looked down at her through the mist and thanked god for the health and strength which made him a fitting protector for her weakness the sound of that involuntary oh jack rang sweetly in his ears and gave a greater confidence to his manner as he steered her through the crowd miss munns told us when you were expected and we talked of meeting you at the station but i decided that i had better stay away then i wrote a letter to welcome you and tore it up then for no purpose at all i began looking at bradshaw and it seemed there was a train which i could catch and it rained it's dismal arriving in the rain next thing i knew i was in the station and the train started when i was sitting inside and here i am sylvia laughed softly it was such an age since she had laughed and it was such a happy contented little sound that she was quite startled thereat the custom-house officials were going through the farce of examining the luggage and while the rest of the passengers groaned and lamented at the delay jack and his companions stood together in the background blissfully unconscious of time and damp are you glad to see me sylvia he asked for the joy of hearing her say in words what voice and eyes had already proclaimed and she waved her hand round the bleak landscape and said tersely look it felt like that black and empty and heartbreaking and all the others seemed to have friends every one but me i think i was never so glad before i shall bless you for coming all my life jack laughed softly and pressed her hand against his arm poor little girl i knew just how you would be feeling that's why i came wouldn't you have come to meet me if you had been the man and i the girl yes to the ends of the earth sylvia replied but not with her lips 
for there are some things which a self-respecting girl may not say however much she may feel them instead she murmured a few non-committal phrases and gave the conversation a less personal tone by inquiring after the various friends at home miss munns bridgie pixie and the boys and jack answered in his usual breezy fashion relating little incidents which made sylvia smile with the old happy sense of friendship repeating loving speeches which brought the grateful tears to her eyes the world was not empty after all while she possessed such faithful loving friends when the luggage had passed the inspection of the custom-house and received the magic mark in chalk jack led the way down the platform before which the train was already drawn up and passed by one carriage after another until at last an empty compartment was discovered of which he immediately took possession now we can talk he said and sat himself down opposite sylvia looking at her with compassionate eyes i have gone through it myself he said tell me all you can and as the train steamed onward sylvia told the story of the past weeks told it quietly and without breakdown though the dark eyes grew moist and tears trembled on the lashes which looked so long and black against the white cheeks it was a comfort to tell it all to one who understood and was full of sympathy and kindness and strange though it might seem separation instead of widening the distance between jack and herself had only drawn them more closely together the old formalities of intercourse had dropped like a cloak at the first moment of meeting they were no longer miss and mister but jack and sylvia no longer acquaintances but dear and intimate friends miss munns has been terribly distressed jack said when at last the sad recital came to an end she loved your father more than any one in the world and you come next as his child poor old lady it was quite pathetic to see her efforts to make your homecoming as cheerful as possible bridgie says she has put up clean curtains all over the house and discussed the menu for supper for the last week it's her way of showing sympathy the creature and you understand better than myself all that it means different people have different ways haven't they sylvia i came to dover <laughs> yes assented sylvia with a flickering smile you came to dover and aunt margaret put up clean curtains and ordered a roast fowl for supper i know it will be a roast fowl and if you had not warned me in time i should probably have said i could not eat anything and gone to bed supperless without even noticing the curtains i'm afraid i've been horrid to the poor old soul in that sort of way many times in the last two years it is good of her to take such trouble because honestly speaking she won't be any more pleased to have me back as a permanency than i am to come we have mutually comforted ourselves with the reflection that it was only for a time but now it is different i want to be good i have made oh such a crowd of good resolutions but i don't know how long they will last jack looked down at his boots and drew his brows together thoughtfully you uh it it's too early i suppose to have made any plans for the future you hardly know what you will do no my natural home is of course with aunt margaret as father's sister but there are other considerations sylvia hesitated a moment then added impetuously it seems so natural to confide in jack about money i mean i i don't know what i have or if i have anything at all father always said he was poor though he seemed to have enough for what he wanted and to give me all i asked perhaps he made enough to keep us but had nothing to leave behind mrs nisbet just referred to the subject one evening and i could see from her manner that there was something i did not know so i turned the conversation at once i had had so much trouble that i felt as if i simply could not bear any more bad news just then and would rather remain in ignorance as long as possible it was a week perhaps but can't you understand the feeling me name's o'shaughnessy said jack simply we never face a disagreeable fact until it comes so close that we hit ourselves against it i'm sorry but don't worry more than you can help 
i've been short of money all my life but i don't know any one who has had a better time so long as you have youth and health what does it matter whether you are rich or poor it's all in the way you look at things for useful purposes most people can make their money go farther than mine but for sheer fun and enjoyment i'll back my half-crown against another fellow's sovereign oh but you're irish you have the happy temperament which can throw off troubles and forget all about them for the time being they sit right down upon my shoulders little black imps of care and anxiety and quaking fears and press so heavily that i can remember nothing else perhaps i could be philosophical too if i were one of a big happy family but when one is all alone all alone when i'm here how can you be all alone when there are two of ye cried jack impulsively he had resolved not once but a hundred times over that he would speak no words but those of friendship that no temptation however strong should make him break his vow of silence but some impulses seem independent of thought he did not know what he was going to do he was conscious of no mental prompting but one moment he was quietly sitting in his corner opposite sylvia and the next he was seated beside her with both arms wrapped tightly round her trembling figure and she was shedding tears of mingled sorrow and happiness upon his shoulder i've been in love with you ever since the first evening you came to our house before that ever since i saw you sitting up at your window in your little red jacket you knew it didn't you you found that out for yourself no yes sometimes only i thought i was afraid it couldn't be true and and there was molly faltered sylvia incoherently hardly knowing what she was saying conscious of nothing but an overwhelming sense of content and well-being as the strong arm supported her tired back and the big tender finger wiped away her tears jack laughed at the suggestion but did not indulge in the depreciatory remarks concerning miss burrell which many men would have used under the circumstances good old molly he said she's a broth of a girl but i would as soon think of marrying bridgie herself she was my confidant bless her and cheered me up when i was down on my luck you might have noticed how interested she was in you that night at esmeralda's crush at that sylvia opened her eyes wide with a sudden unpleasant recollection what will esmeralda think oh jack what will she say plenty my dear you may be sure of that replied jack laughing then he too gave a little start of surprise and straightening himself held sylvia from him at the length of his strong young arms i say what's this you little witch what have you done to me i had made a solemn vow not to speak a word of love-making and it seems to me i have broken it pretty successfully have i been making love to you sylvia have i it was a very charming little face that laughed back at him pale no longer but flushed to a delicate pink the dark eyes a sparkle with happiness and a tinge of the old mischievous spirit yes you have do you want to draw back jack's answer was wordless but convincing but the next moment he sobered and said in that charming way of his which was at once so manly and so boyish but i didn't want to bind you i spoke only for myself i am your property darling and your slave to command but i can't ask you to marry me yet a while for i've the children on my hands and until they are settled i can't think of myself i am head of the house and must do what i can for them poor creatures pat will be off to the agricultural college next term and then back to ireland to do agent's work miles is doing well in the city but can't keep himself for several years to come and then there are the girls i had no right to speak as i did it wasn't fair to you i won't bind you down to a long uncertain engagement you must feel yourself free perfectly free i don't want to be free i like to be bound to you jack sylvia said firmly 
i am so thankful that you did speak for it makes just all the difference in my life i am young and can wait quite happily and contentedly so long as i know that you care and can look forward sylvia stopped short awed at the prospect of happiness which had suddenly opened before her and jack was silent too holding her hand in a close pressure his face was very tender but troubled through all its tenderness and when he spoke again it was in very anxious accents but are you contented to leave it a secret darling a secret between you and me you see if bridgie knew we were waiting she'd know no peace feeling that she was in our way and the young ones would get the same fancy and be wanting to turn out before they were ready they have no one but me and i couldn't have them feeling upset in their own home that was why i determined to keep silent and it's bad of me to have broken my vow but it's your own fault darling i couldn't be with you again and keep quiet do you care for me enough to wait perhaps for years before we can even be publicly engaged sylvia smiled at him bravely but her heart sank a little poor girl as it was only natural it should do a girl is by nature much quicker than a man projecting herself into the future and in realizing all that is involved jack was conscious only of a general regret that he could not claim his bride before the world but sylvia saw in a flash the impossibility of frequent meetings the minute chance of tete-a-tetes the quicksands in the shape of misunderstandings which must needs attend so unnatural a position on the other hand she honoured jack the more for his loyalty to his home duties and agreed with the wisdom of his decision yes jack i do i'd like to wait i love bridgie with all my heart and could not bear her to suffer through me it shall be exactly as you think best for them in every way jack bent and kissed her even more tenderly than before my little helpmeet he said and sylvia found her best reward in the sound of that word and the knowledge that she was strengthening him in the right path surely it was the best guarantee for the happiness of their new relationship that it was inaugurated in a spirit of self-sacrifice and care for others end of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reminiscences Bridgie was not waiting at the station. She heard me saying that I might be here myself and maybe remembered that two are company, said Jack with a laugh. But when Rutland Road was reached, someone stood waiting to open the door of the cab and welcome the wanderer in the sweetest tones of a sweet contralto voice. She said only a few words, but with true Irish tact, chose just the ones which were most comforting under the circumstances. Welcome back, dear. I've missed you badly. So have we all. Then she looked at Jack and smiled as if his presence were the most natural thing in the world you have brought her home safely that's right she said it was one of bridgie's most lovable qualities that she never asked awkward questions nor showed undue curiosity about the affairs of others brother and sister said good-bye at the door leaving aunt and niece alone and as the door closed behind them sylvia felt a spasm of loneliness and regret it was hard to part from jack with that formal shake of the hand to feel that days might elapse before they met again and as she looked round the ugly little dining-room she felt like a prisoned bird which longs to break loose the bars and fly to its mate it seemed impossible to settle down to the old monotonous life and yet and yet how much much worse it might have been how thankful she ought to be if one hope had been taken away 
another had been granted in its stead the path ahead was still bright with promise and a sudden pity seized her for the woman whose youth was gone and who had lost the last tie to the past she returned her aunt's kisses with unusual affection and roused herself to notice and show appreciation of the efforts which had been made on her behalf the table was laid with the best china the red satin tea cosy had been brought from its hiding-place upstairs and divested of its muslin bag and holland wrappings the centre mat presented by cousin mary ferguson two christmases ago was displayed for the first time the serviettes were folded into rakish imitations of cocked hats it was half touching half gruesome to find the occasion turned into a fete but sylvia was determined to be amiable and said gratefully how kind of you to have supper ready for me aunt margaret i could not eat anything on the boat but now i believe i am hungry it all looks very good the chickens one gets in france are not the least like the ones at home they don't know how to feed them my dear i am glad you have an appetite i always find that when i am in trouble nothing tempts me so much as a cup of tea and a slice off the breast just take off your hat and sit down as you are everything is ready miss munns was evidently gratified to receive an acknowledgment of her efforts and insisted upon waiting upon her niece and loading her plate with one good thing after another but after the meal was over there followed a painful half-hour when sylvia had to submit to a searching cross-questioning on the events of the past weeks unlike bridgie miss munns insisted upon detail had a ghoulish curiosity to know in exactly what words mrs nisbet had broken the sad news in exactly what words sylvia had replied in exactly what manner the first black days had been spent her spectacles were dimmed with tears as she listened to what the girl had to tell and her thin lips quivered with a genuine grief but she was still acutely interested to hear of the number of carriages at the funeral of the meals in the hotel and the purchase of sylvia's mourning garments you must show them to me to-morrow i expect they are very smart coming from france i always wear black so there was not much to be done i had the black satin taken off my cashmere dress and folds of crape put in its place and some dull trimming instead of jet on my cape i haven't decided about my bonnet you must give me your advice of course i wish to do everything that is proper but it's been an expensive year yes assented sylvia absently she rose from her seat and walking across the room leant her elbow on the mantelpiece there was something she wanted to say and it was easier to say it with averted face aunt margaret i want to ask you a question please tell me the truth shall i have any money was father able to provide for me i know you are not well off and i could not bear to be a burden to you if i have no money of my own i must try to earn some i should be telling you the truth my dear if i said that i knew less about it than you do yourself your father was very close about business matters very close indeed he was supposed to have a good business a few years ago and was always very handsome in his ways but he has grumbled a good deal of late and i don't know how things will be now he is gone he had a lawsuit with an old partner in salon which hung on a long time i don't know if it is settled yet and if not we shall have to let it drop you can always have a home with me but there will be nothing to spare for lawyers expenses give me a bird in the hand as i said to your father the last time he was home if the worst comes to the worst you can give some music lessons in the neighbourhood mrs burton was telling me on monday that her little boy has quite a taste picks out all the barrel organ tunes on the piano with one finger you might get him as a beginning 
yes assented sylvia faintly and to herself she cried oh jack dear how good of you to love me how good of you to give me something to live for how dreadful 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 i should be feeling now if you had not met me and made the whole world different miss munns was watching her anxiously fearing a burst of tears and was greatly relieved when she turned round and showed a composed and even smiling face i'll find some work if it is necessary auntie I'll, and i'll try to help you too you've been very good to me and i'm afraid i have been rather horrid sometimes i thought of it when i was away and determined to make a fresh start if you would forgive me this time we're the only two left and we ought to love each other i'm sure i am very much attached to you my dear i was saying so to miss o'shaughnessy only to-day i don't deny that your manner is rather sharp at times but there's nothing like trouble for taming the spirits i shouldn't wonder if we got along much more happily after this miss bridgie brought a little parcel for you i mustn't forget that it's on that little table she told me to give it to you at once what can it be i wonder something i left over there by mistake i suppose sylvia said listlessly as she unfolded the paper but her expression altered the next moment as she beheld a flat leather case inside which reposed a miniature painting of the same face which used to smile upon her from her own chimney-piece surprise held her speechless while a quick rush of tears testified more eloquently than words to the faithfulness of the portrait the painting was exquisitely fine and soft the setting the perfection of good taste in its handsome severity it seemed at the moment just the greatest treasure which the world could offer who could have sent it sylvia reluctantly handed the case for miss munn's curious scrutiny while she opened the note which had fallen from the paper bridgie's handwriting confronted her but she had hardly time to marvel how so costly a gift could come from such an impecunious donor before surprise number two confronted her in the opening words esmeralda told me to give you this miniature from myself but i want you to know that it is entirely her idea and present from the beginning as soon as she heard your sad news she asked me to borrow the best photograph of your father to be copied by the same artist who painted the major for her she has been to see how he was getting on almost every day till the poor man was thankful to finish it just to be rid of her and here it is to welcome you dear and we hope be a comfort to you all your life esmeralda echoed sylvia blankly it seemed for a moment as if bridgie must be romancing for the staid english mind refused to believe that one who had at one time appeared actively antagonistic and at the best had shown nothing warmer than a lofty tolerance should suddenly become the most thoughtful and generous of friends yet there it was specified in black and white esmeralda had originated the kindly plan she had engaged no second-rate artist but one to whom her own work had been entrusted and had given freely of what was even more value to her than money her time in order that the gift should arrive at the right moment sylvia flushed with a gratification which was twofold in its nature for here at last seemed an opening of drawing near in heart to that beautiful baffling personality who was jack's sister and might some day oh wonderful thought be her own also it would be a triumph indeed if in these days of waiting she could overcome the last lingering prejudice and feel that there would be no dissentient note when at last the great secret was revealed aunt and niece hung together over the case with its precious contents the one exhausting herself in expressions of gratitude and appreciation the other equally delighted but quite unable to resist looking the gift-horse in the mouth 
and speculating in awed tones concerning the enormous cost of ivory miniatures that jarred but on the whole the evening passed more pleasantly than sylvia could have believed possible the unexpected excitement breaking the thread of that painful cross-examination and carrying the old lady's thoughts back to the far-off days when she and her brother had been sworn friends and playmates tell me what you used to do auntie it must be so nice to have someone to play with do tell me some of your escapades she pleaded wistfully and miss munns shook her head and assumed a great air of disapproval though it was easy to see that she cherished a secret pride in the remembrance of her own audacities i am afraid we were very naughty thankless children one day i remember teddy as we used to call him had been very rightly punished for disobedience and he confided in me that he intended to run away and go to sea as a cabin boy we always did everything together in those days so of course nothing must suit me but i must go too we got up early the next morning and ran out into the garden where we were allowed to play before breakfast then slipped out of the side door to walk to portsmouth portsmouth was eighteen miles away and i was only six and before we had walked two miles i was crying with fatigue and hunger teddy had brought some bread and butter so we sat under a hedge to eat it and he told me we must be very nearly there just then up came a tramp and stopped to ask why we were crying and what we were doing out there in the road at that hour in the morning we are going to portsmouth to be cabin boys we told him and i can remember to this day how he laughed if you are going to be cabin boys you won't want those clothes he said you had better take them off and give them to me to change for proper sailor things we thought that a splendid idea so he took teddy's suit and my frock and hat and left us shivering under the hedge waiting his return of course he never came and an hour or two later my father came driving along to look for us and we were taken home and punished as we deserved that is to say teddy was whipped and i was only put to bed for he insisted that the idea was his and that he alone was to blame oh nice little teddy murmured sylvia fondly looking down at the pictured face which despite grey hair and wrinkles had still the gallant air of the little boy who shielded his sister from blame having once started miss munns told one story after another of her childhood days of the lessons which brother and sister used to learn together a whole page of magnol's questions at a time and of the dire and terrible conspiracy by which they learnt alternate answers easily persuading the docile governess to take the right turns thus teddy when asked what is starch could reply with prompt accuracy while remaining in dense ignorance of the date when printing was introduced into england concerning which his small sister was so well informed sylvia was told of the books which were read and re-read until the pages came loose from their bindings of the thrilling adventures of one masterman ready whose stockade being besieged by savages it became an immediate necessity to guard the gate at the head of the nursery stairs and to hurl a succession of broken toys at the innocent nurse as she forced an entry of a misguided and stubborn rosamond who expended her savings on a large purple vase from a chemist's window and found to her chagrin that when the water was poured away it was only a plain glass bottle and of a certain layla who sojourned on a desert island in the utmost comfort and luxury being possessed of a clever father who found all that he needed on the trees in the forest an hour later when sylvia went up to her room it was impossible to resist drawing aside the blind to look across the road and in an instant another blind was pulled back and a tall dark figure stood clearly outlined against the lighted background 
sylvia understood that jack had been watching for her advent and felt comforted by his presence and all that was meant by that waving hand she wondered whether she had better write to esmeralda or try to see her in person but the question was decided by pixie who came over early the next morning to announce mrs hilliard's arrival in the afternoon she wants to see you and say she's sorry she explained and when sylvia exhausted herself in expressions of gratitude and delight oh esmeralda would give you her skin if it would fit ye she said coolly she's the kindest of us all when she isn't cross give her her way and you may have all the rest i've known her raise the roof on us and appealing to every relation we owned to get what she wanted and then wrap it up in brown paper that very day and post it back where it came i'm glad ye like it so much now if i'd been clever and bought some more paints when those people wanted me maybe i could have done it for you meself her face grew suddenly grave and wistful when i got my telegram at school the girls all brought me home presents from the walk pencil boxes and jujubes and a little toy rabbit that wagged its head i don't know how it was but they soothed my feelings i should have liked to buy you something sylvia but i don't get my wages till the end of the month and then they are spent you'll excuse me won't you me dear for you know i am sorry my darling girl i don't want presents come to see me as often as you can and go on being fond of me that's all i want cried sylvia warmly and pixie brightened once more there's no credit in that it isn't as if you were nasty i'll not be able to call on ye as often as i'd like for i'm off to the seaside mrs wallace has taken a house on the thames and her cousin is coming home from the wars and a friend with him and lots of ladies and gentlemen all staying in the house to be entertained so they want me to go too of course of course repeated sylvia gravely there was something so charming in pixie's simple assumption that every one desired her company that she would not for the world have tried to destroy it i hope you will enjoy yourself very much dear and come back with some colour in your cheeks though i am afraid that particular part of the seaside is not very bracing tell mrs hilliard with my love that i shall be charmed to see her this afternoon End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of More About Pixie by Mrs. George T. Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Esmeralda's Visit Miss Munns was greatly excited to hear of the expected visit and busied herself taking the holland covers off the drawing-room chairs and displaying the best antimacassars in the most advantageous position sylvia longed to introduce a little disorder into the painful severity of the room but it would have distressed her aunt if she had moved a chair out of the straight or confiscated one of the books which were ranged at equal distances round the rosewood table and as it was one of her resolves not to interfere with domestic arrangements she shrugged her shoulders resignedly and hoped that esmeralda might be as unnoticing of her surroundings as were her brothers and sisters at four o'clock a carriage drove up to the door and esmeralda alighted clad from head to foot in black as sylvia noticed at the first quick glance she was waiting in the little drawing-room and scarcely was the door opened when the tall figure was at her side and her hands were crushed with affectionate fervour she looked up and was startled by the beauty of the face above her startled as even esmeralda's brothers and sisters were at times when as now the grey eyes were misty with tears and the lips all sweet and tremulous if i'd known if i'd had the slightest idea he was ill i would rather have killed myself than have behaved as i did oh don't pretend you didn't notice i was hateful to you when you were ill too poor creature 
and my sister's guest i told jeff all about it i hate telling him when i do wrong so i did it just as a penance and he was so vexed with me do you know why i spoke as i did did you guess the reason sylvia shrank into herself with an uneasy foreboding for esmeralda was an impetuous creature who might be expected to be as undisguised in her penitence as in a fence oh please don't say anything more about it she cried hurriedly it was very trying for you finding me there when you came over for a visit i have forgotten all about it if there is anything to forget and now there's this lovely miniature how can i thank you oh that is nothing that's nothing cried esmeralda waving aside the subject and insisting upon a full confession of her fault i was jealous of you that is what it was jealous because they all seemed so fond of you and i wanted their attention for myself it was horribly mean because i have jeff and the boy and it is only natural that they should want their own interests i dare say pixie has told you how father spoiled me all my life and bridgie gave way to me until it seemed natural to think first of myself but i don't now i think of geoffrey and the boy and i'm trying to be better for their sake jeff says he got me only just in time he is rather stern with me sometimes do you know he doesn't say much perhaps i don't give him the chance but his face sets and his eyes are so large and grave i can't bear it when he looks at me like that because as a rule you know she gave a soft happy little laugh <laughs> he loves me so frightfully much and we are so happy together i ought to want every girl to be as happy as i am and i do really i do in a month or two when we are home at knock will you come and stay with me sylvia and learn to be fond of me too i'm rather lonely over there now that all the others have left and i have not many girl friends the one i cared for most will be engaged soon i think and the man lives abroad so she may be leaving the neighbourhood it is not settled yet but i think mrs burrell will give in she stared ostentatiously through the window and sylvia blushed and had some ado not to smile at this very transparent intimation of hostility withdrawn thank you so much i'd love to come she said simply and then the two girls talked quietly for a few minutes before miss munns came in and dispensed tea and reminiscences of all the grand people whom she had ever met with a view of impressing her visitor who of course was not impressed at all but secretly amused as listeners invariably are under such circumstances esmeralda was just rising to leave when a loud rat-tat at the knocker made sylvia's heart leap in expectation and the next moment jack came into the room in his most easy and assured manner i thought i would come across for my sister and inquire how miss trevor was after her journey he announced and once more sylvia smiled to herself as she noted how esmeralda immediately plunged into animated conversation with miss munns to keep her attention engrossed at the opposite end of the room jack o'shaughnessy stood by the window and looked down upon his little love with tender dissatisfied eyes i say he said softly i can't stand this sort of thing two minutes talk with two other people in the room how much longer do you suppose i can stand this you've had only one day yet it's too soon to complain you may have seven years retorted sylvia saucily but at the bottom of her heart she was glad that he found it difficult to be patient end of chapter twenty seven
Chapter twenty eight of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By the River Pixie went off in great spirits to join the Wallaces at the riverside cottage which they had rented for the remainder of the summer the heat in town was already growing oppressive and it was delightful to think of being in the country again and running free over the dear green fields esmeralda had presented her with quite a trousseau of summer dresses with a selection of hair ribbons to match at least an inch wider than any which she had previously possessed and she piled up her pompadour higher than ever and pulled out the bows to their farthest extent in her anxiety to do justice to the occasion and the importance of her own position as the instructor of youth a pony cart was at the station to meet her with viva and inda clinging together on the front seat ready to pour breathless confidences into her ear the moment she appeared they spoke with a curious mingling of tongues but had apparently no difficulty in understanding her when she replied in rapid colloquial french so that it was evident that the hours of play had not been wasted but had the effect of successful study mamselle mamselle patty we have boats in our house cried viva eagerly three boats with cushions and a punt and one with a funnel in the miggle and cousin jim takes us out with another gentleman and we splash with our hands and the lady was cross because of her sash and she dried it in the sun and there's tea in the garden and a big steamer that makes waves and muzzer says if we are very good you will play with us at being gypsies under the wheelbarrow and we got in a box and the water went up and up and up and then it went down and down and down and then we came home contributed fat little enda in her deep gurgling voice and pixie turned from one to the other and cried vraiment sans doute bravo and beamed in delighted expectation the house party were assembled on the lawn drinking tea when the pony carriage turned in at the gate and pixie looked round with sparkling eyes quite dazzled by the beauty of the scene the narrow road running at the back of the houses had been dull and uninteresting but before many yards of the drive had been traversed there came a view over the wide sunlit river and beyond it green meadows stretching as far away as the eye could reach the house was not a cottage after all but quite a large imposing-looking house and the lawn sloping to the river bank was smooth and soft as velvet baskets of flowers hung from the veranda picturesque stumps of trees were hollowed out to receive pots of geraniums a red and white awning shaded the tea-table and the wicker chairs were plentifully supplied with scarlet cushions it was pixie's first peep at the summer glories of the river and she felt as if she had stepped into fairyland itself the little girls seized her hands and dragged her in triumph across the lawn and mrs wallace looked round and said smilingly to her friends here's my french governess the latest addition to the household what do you think of my choice governess that girl she looks the child herself edith what nonsense are you talking sense my dear i assure you the wisest thing i ever did as you will see before many hours are past we shall have some peace now that she has arrived bonjour mademoiselle how i am happy to see thee again thou art not fatigued no seat thyself in this chair and i will make known to thee my friends she spoke in french and evidently wished her governess to appear as french on this occasion at least and pixie rose to the occasion sweeping elaborate bows from side to side unconsciously elevating her shoulders and waving expressive hands she discoursed volubly about her long and adventurous journey of three-quarters of an hour duration and mrs wallace's guests looked on with smiling faces putting an occasional laborious question as she appeared to be reaching the end of her story 
there were several ladies all young and pretty and beautifully dressed and three strange men including cousin jim and his soldier friend from india cousin jim had bright twinkling eyes and looked full of life and spirit but his friend's brown face was lined and haggard and his smile was half-hearted as if his thoughts were not in the present pixie noticed however that it was to his side that little inda crept for support and that his disengaged hand softly stroked the child's head from time to time as if he found comfort in her presence such good friends did they appear that after the meal was finished she refused to be separated from him and implored his company in the gypsy tent in the paddock mrs wallace protested but the young fellow declared that he enjoyed being victimized and walked off with the schoolroom party with the utmost good humour but i can't speak french viva he explained not well enough to be able to converse with mademoiselle at least you must explain to her that i am only a stupid englishman and ask her to excuse me you can translate that for me i suppose she's not french either she's only pretending she's only english the same as me protested viva sturdily and pixie nodded at him with complacent smiles but i've lived abroad so i speak it to them for their good you've been away too haven't you i hope you enjoyed yourself he smiled but it was rather a sad little smile despite its amusement i went for work you know not pleasure we accomplished what there was to do which was satisfactory but i can't honestly say i enjoyed it i hate work agreed pixie sympathetically we all do it's in the family never do to-day what you can put off till to-morrow my brother used to tell me for you never know what may happen and you may get out of it altogether if you wait but if we are obliged to do it we pretend we like it for it's so dull to be unhappy and if it was horrid abroad it makes it all the nicer to come back doesn't it sometimes he said shortly they had reached the gypsy encampment by this time and were peremptorily commanded to sit down on a bench pending certain important preparations under the wheelbarrow so he took possession of one corner and pixie took the other and stared at him with unabashed scrutiny he was unhappy she decided and that was enough to enlist her whole-hearted sympathy but besides being unhappy he was very good to look upon with his bronzed skin well-cut features and soldierly bearing she admired him immensely and the admiration was mutual though of a different nature she was a quaint-looking little soul the young fellow decided plain-looking he had thought on first sight but there was something oddly attractive about the wide eyes and large curving lips you wanted to look at them once and yet again and each time you looked the attraction increased what was it not beauty not intellect not wit nothing it appeared but a crystalline sincerity and sweetness of heart which exercised an irresistible claim on the affections his face softened and he bent toward her with a kindly questioning how do you come to be governessing these children you are so young still sixteen seventeen is it you ought to be in the schoolroom yourself there was nothing else i could do and i wanted to earn some money because we're poor i'm small but i've known a lot of trouble replied pixie with a complacent air which was distinctly trying to her companion's composure he stroked his moustache to hide the twitching lips and said solemnly i'm sorry very sorry to hear that i hope however it is all in the past you look remarkably cheerful now that's because i'm helping and we are such a nice family at home if you are with the people you like best that makes you happy doesn't it without thinking of anything else yes he
he said shortly and rose from his seat to walk across to where the children were scrambling on the grass they leapt on him and hung on his arms and he played with them for five or ten minutes then produced a packet of chocolate from a pocket and giving it to pixie to distribute made his escape to the house End of chapter 28chapter twenty nine of more about pixie by mrs george dehorn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a confidence during the next few days the captain as viva called him was constantly deserting his companions to join himself to the schoolroom party in their walks and games as pixie had suspected his heart was sore and the innocent affection which the children lavished upon him made their society more congenial than that of his own companions who were enjoying their stay in the country in merry uproarious fashion viva and inda were interesting and original children while mamzelle patty was a house-party in herself a delicious combination of shrewdness and innocence he had little chance of private conversation with her for the children were exacting in their demands but their intimacy rapidly increased as was only natural under the circumstances it was impossible to remain on formal terms with one who was united with yourself to withstand an assault of wild savages as portrayed by two little girls with branches of bracken waving above their heads and geranium petals stuck in ferocious patterns about their cheeks impossible not to feel an affection for the tallest member of the battalion which marched regularly every morning to the corner of the paddock to be drilled by their commander scarlet sashes crossed sideways over holland dresses and panama hats fastened by immaculate black chin straps in the afternoon when the grown-up members of the household drove off in state to attend garden parties at neighbouring mansions the captain found it infinitely more enjoyable to punt slowly down the stream dreaming his own dreams or listening with a smile while the older child amused her juniors by quaint and adventurous stories she was always happy this little mamzelle patty another girl of her age might have felt lonely and diffident in this large bustling household but she was sunshine personified content to work content to play content to go on an expedition content to be left behind having no desires of her own it would appear excepting only this one to love and be loved by those around some day mamzelle the captain said i will take you and the children a little jaunt on our own account we will take a boat and go up the river to a dear little spot which i know very well and there we will have tea and pretend to be robinson crusoe's on a desert island it is an island you know and we will take a basket of provisions with us and boil our own kettle and spread the tablecloth under the trees robinson didn't have tablecloths i believe but we will improve on the story and go shopping in the village to see what we can buy want to go now inda insisted while viva executed a war dance of triumph and pixie murmured deeply i love picnics we had a beauty once when i was young twas some friends near by and they asked me and miles and ye could smell the cooking coming up the drive all sorts of things cooked for days before and packed in hampers we went there by train to the place we were going to i mean but by bad luck the hampers went somewhere else through leaving them on the platform without seeing them put in 
ye get very hungry when you are enjoying yourself and there was nothing to be bought in the village but bread and spring onions and herrings in barrels twas a lucky accident all the same for we had the picnic and a party next day to eat up the food well <laughs> we'll look after the hamper this time we should not find even the onions on our island said the captain laughing we will ask mrs wallace's permission when she comes home and begin preparations to-morrow morning if it is fine mrs wallace protested that the children were being spoiled by so much kindness but was delighted to give her consent and the next morning was happily employed in packing the tea-basket and purchasing strawberries cakes and chocolates from the shops in the village several of the visitors pleaded to be allowed to join the party and tried to wheedle invitations from the children during the luncheon hour to their own humiliation and defeat you would like to have me with you wouldn't you darling you would like to sit next to me in the boat pleaded one pretty young lady of the chubby baby but inda wriggled away and replied sturdily don't want you in the boat don't want nobody only the captain and mamselle you go another picnic by yourself you must forgive us miss rose but this is strictly a limited expedition we children want to be as mischievous as we like without the controlling influence of grown-up people no best frocks please mrs wallace just tall and pinafores that we can soil as much as we like pleaded the captain feeling more than rewarded for his firmness as he met the adoring glances of three pairs of innocent eyes there was quite a little assembly by the boat-house to speed the expedition on its way and it is safe to say that no boat on the river that afternoon carried a happier more excited party the captain rowed pixie sat in the stern and pulled the rudder lines according to instructions with occasional lapses of memory when she mistook her right hand for her left and was surprised to find the boat going in an opposite direction from what had been intended the little girls sat on either side as yet too mindful of their promises of good behaviour even to splash the water they snored with excitement at the mystery of the first lock and wrapped their hands in their pinafores to keep them safely out of the way since the captain said that it was impossible to be too careful in such places along the banks were dotted beautiful houses set back in luxuriant gardens round the bend of the river stood a houseboat known by the fascinating name of the yellow butterfly the paint was white but everything else was a rich glowing yellow yellow plants and flowers in baskets yellow curtains to the windows yellow cushions on the chairs actually if you can believe it a yellow parakeet in a golden cage on the top deck i should like to live and die in that houseboat cried viva rapturously presently came the sound of music from afar and a thud 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 which foretold the advent of a steamer now there would be waves real true up and down waves and you could pretend you were going to be drowned and the boat go upside down what fun what fun the gurgles of excitement the clutchings of mamselle's skirts the shrieks of exultation as the happy moment grew near were as charming to the beholder as to the children themselves in the sunny reaches of the river the boats carried japanese umbrellas which made charming touches of colour against the green under the great trees more boats were moored in the shade while their occupants brought out the tea-baskets from beneath the seats viva and inda regarded all such proceedings as deliberate offences against their exclusive rights and angrily pointed out the fact that other people were having picnics too but the captain soothed them by a promise that the island should be their private property and that he would fight to the death to keep off foreign invasions already this land of promise was looming in the distance and presently they were rowing slowly round and round looking for a convenient place of landing tying the rope to the trunk of a willow whose branches dipped in the stream 
and stepping cautiously ashore the children were wild with excitement but the captain claimed for himself a quarter of an hour's rest and smoke before proceeding to the difficult business of boiling the kettle and the two little girls scampered off to explore the island promising faithfully to keep clear of the banks mademoiselle shall stay and talk to me it's my turn to be amused he said but for once pixie did not seem in a talkative mood but leant silently against the stump of a tree staring around her with dreamy eyes the young fellow watched her curiously as he pulled his pipe out of his pocket and prepared for the longed-for smoke what are you thinking of mamselle he asked and pixie looked round with a little start of remembrance i don't know everything nothing in particular only that it's so warm and sunny and pretty and you are so kind i wasn't thinking anything really only being happy only being happy were you he repeated softly does it seem so easy little mamselle some of the richest men in the world would give all their money if you could teach them that little secret only being happy is a very difficult thing to some of us as we grow older in this world pixie looked at him with an anxious scrutiny but you were happy once weren't you she asked before you were miserable people have been kind to you too and made you happy before you began to be worried i worried i miserable mamselle what can you mean i am out for a picnic with three charming ladies for my guests how can i be anything but proud and delighted he spoke with affected hilarity but pixie was not so easily convinced and shook her head incredulously as she replied no you are not happy really not through and through ye sigh in the middle of laughing and think of something else when you pretend to listen i've been in trouble meself once there was an awful time when the girls sent me to coventry for weeks on end and there was a horrid dull pain inside me as if i'd swallowed up a lump of lead was some one unkind to you too he laughed a short mirthless laugh and pushed his hair from his brow it was a strange thing that he should dream of confiding his story to this bit of a girl yet never before had he known such an impulse to speak no mamselle he said not unkind it was not in her nature to be that the mistake was all on my side i was a conceited coxcomb to think she could ever care for me but i did think it and went on dreaming my foolish castle in the air until one day it fell to the ground and left me sitting among the ruins it was a hard affair then i thought it was cried pixie shrewdly i heard a lot about heart affairs in paris and i had a sister once who was married her husband used to look just like you do when she was cross to him but really and truly she wanted to be kind and now they are married and living happily ever after it will come all right for you too some day no never there's no hope of that she married someone else that was the news which came to me one day and wrecked my castle oh oh how could she the misguided creature and when she might have had you instead i'd marry you myself if i were big enough cried pixie in a fervour of indignation which was more soothing than any expressions of sympathy and the captain stretched out his hand and patted her tenderly on the shoulder would you really that's very sweet of you thank you dear for the compliment we will be real good friends in any case won't we and you will keep my confidence for no one in this place knows anything about it and we won't talk of it any more i think it's rather a sore subject don't you know 
we might begin unpacking those baskets the children will want their tea end of chapter twenty nine Chapter thirty of More About Pixie by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Lock The tea making was attended with the usual excitements, and the kettle boiling with the inevitable misadventures. A scouting party was organized to discover a sheltered spot in which to lay the fire but although until this minute the day had appeared absolutely calm and tranquil all the winds of heaven seemed to unite in blowing upon that unfortunate fire from the moment that the match was applied when at long last a feeble flame was established the sticks promptly collapsed and precipitated the kettle to the ground when rebuilt more solidly it died out for want of a draught and when at last and at last and at very long last the smoke was seen issuing from the kettle spout lo the water was smoked and unfit to drink so decided the captain at least but while he drank milk with the little girls pixie emptied the teapot with undiminished enjoyment it gives it a flavour she said i like to taste what i'm drinking it was not a trifle like smoked tea which would mar mademoiselle patty's enjoyment when on pleasure bent the captain's preparations had been on so lavish a scale that there was quite a supply of good things left when the meal was finished and by a kindly thought these were packed together to give to the children of the lock keeper on the way up stream when every odd piece of paper had been religiously collected and packed in the hamper with the cups and saucers the little girls were lifted into the boat pixie pulled the rudder ropes over her shoulders and the captain pushed the boat from the shore and jumped lightly into his seat they were off again rowing homewards and passing once more all the fascinating landmarks which they had noticed on the way down the picnickers on the banks were fastening hampers and preparing to depart on the green lawns by the waterside servants were flitting to and fro carrying trays into the house inda was beginning to yawn and long for bed she leant against pixie the weight of the small head becoming ever heavier and heavier but roused up again as the boat entered the box as she persisted in calling a lock she wanted to hand out the parcel of good things without a moment's delay but the captain told her to wait until the water had lifted the boat nearer to the bank it seemed an extraordinary thing that whereas in passing through the lock before they had gone down 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 they should now rise higher with every moment that passed the children had a hundred questions to ask while the captain stood up and kept the boat in position with a boat hook he explained the mystery as simply as possible and also why he was at such pains to keep at a safe distance from the walls you see those things sticking out from the side of the boat into which i put my oars they are called rollocks and when you are coming upstream through a lock you have to be careful indeed not to let them catch under any of the beams it would be almost impossible to get them loose again you see because every moment more water would pour in and press them tighter and tighter and what would it do to us if it did press them viva inquired curiously whereat the captain smiled and shook his head something very disagreeable i'm afraid give us all a good wetting in the water you needn't be afraid of that though when you're with me for i shall take good care of my little crew you see how far away i keep with this oar yes i see but why does one end of the boat stick out into the middle and the other into the side it's the current that sweeps it round the force of the water that is coming under the gates that doesn't matter so long as we are not caught but the end is caught isn't it that little bit of iron that sticks up at the pointed end cried pixie suddenly she was densely ignorant of all that concerns boats and invariably alluded to the bow and the stern as the blunt and pointed ends to the captain's intense amusement this time however 
he did not smile pixie saw his face set suddenly as he turned his head to look in the direction of her outstretched finger but his voice sounded reassuringly confident oh i see yes let me pass you dear for a moment sit quite still he stepped past her into the space occupied by the hampers and stamped vigorously first with one foot then with two jumped with all his weight then stepped quickly back to the centre of the boat and called to the man at the sluices hi there stop my boat is caught turn off that water quick man do you hear me but the man's head was turned in the opposite direction and he was so much engrossed with his work that it was some moments before he heard and meantime it was terrifying to see how swiftly the water arose how dangerously near to its edge grew the side of the boat the children began to shriek and stand on their seats and the captain seized inda in his arms and held her up calling loudly for help the lock-keeper was hurriedly dropping the sluices but at the sound of the continued cries his wife ran out of the house and across the bridgeway in another moment she would be able to lift inda ashore but viva frantic with terror was clamouring to be taken too and pixie impetuously lifted her towards the bank what happened next is difficult to describe so swiftly did it happen so like a nightmare did it appear for ever after in the memories of those concerned the woman came rushing forward followed by her husband they seized the children and dragged them on the bank the boat relieved suddenly of a weight gave an unexpected lurch and the next moment pixie and the captain were in the water the children screamed aloud in terror but the captain had hardly disappeared before he was up again capless and shaking the water from his head but looking none the worse for his ducking but it was a long agonizing minute before there came a swirling and bubbling at the end of the lock and pixie's white unconscious little face floated on the surface the captain's arm was round her in an instant the lock-keeper threw a rope to help him to the iron ladder fixed in the walls of the lock and between them the two men carried the dripping figure along the bank and into the house there was a sofa in an inner room and there they laid her while the woman assisted by her eldest daughter took off the wringing garments and wrapped her round with warm blankets and coverings the captain ran out into the village sent a messenger flying for a doctor and rushed back again in terror lest the two little girls should have taken advantage of his absence to get into fresh mischief this was a pretty ending to their expedition what would mrs wallace say to him when he got home and what should he say to himself if through any fault or carelessness a serious injury had happened to sweet little mamzelle why on earth do they want to put these irons at the end of a boat wretches dangerous things cried the distracted man to himself to think that i have been through a thousand locks and safety and that this should have happened just when i had made myself responsible for a party of children never again never again if i get safely out of this i wonder how long that doctor fellow will take to come along viva and inda were sitting in the front kitchen glancing askance at several rosy curly-headed children who were shyly huddled together by the door the fascination of new surroundings and possible new playmates had diverted their minds from their misfortunes and the captain heaved a sigh of relief as he passed into the inner room the lock-keeper's wife had filled two bottles with hot water and put one to pixie's feet and another between her cold hands a towel was wrapped round the wet locks with somewhat ghastly effect and the young man shivered as he looked down at the still white face she's not she can't can't be he faltered not having the courage to pronounce the dread word and to his inexpressible relief the woman smiled at the thought not she stunned a bit that's all 
perhaps hit her head in falling i've often had them like this before and they are pretty well all right in a few hours we have a lot of people up here in summer time who know nothing about managing a boat no offence to you sir i dare say you are well accustomed to them but accidents will happen i thought i was sighed the captain dismally he knelt down by the couch touched the cold cheek with his fingers feels a little warmer doesn't she for goodness sake take that thing off her head i can't bear to see it the woman lifted the head from the pillow to unloosen the tight folds and at the movement pixie sighed and opened wide bewildered eyes for the first moment they held nothing but blankest surprise at finding herself in so extraordinary a position but even as the captain held his breath in suspense a spark of remembrance came into the clear depths and the face lit up with a flickering merriment were we drowned she whispered hoarsely the two of us viva jumped and the boat slipped and my feet went down who saved me was it you i suppose it was but it was not a very heroic rescue only a few yards to the bank you are sure you feel all right quite warm and comfortable your head doesn't ache pixie shook her dishevelled head from side to side frowning the while in speculative fashion i think it does a little bit but i'm not quite sure it feels muzzy she declared with a gesture and accent which lent some enlightenment to the enigmatical expression then she stretched out a hand and touched him anxiously on the shoulder you're drenched you'll catch all sorts of diseases in those wet clothes can't you have some blankets too i'm so lovely and warm my husband is putting out some clothes for you upstairs sir you had better go and change the young lady is all right now and i will tell you when the doctor comes doctor is a doctor coming to see me pixie asked rapturously incredulous to find herself the heroine of an adventure a genuine thrilling adventure to lie stretched upon a sofa wrapped in blankets with two attendants anxiously inquiring her symptoms to know that a doctor was hurrying to her side this was indeed a glorious ending to the day's enjoyment she lay back on the cushions wreathed in smiles and the doctor coming in hurriedly was somewhat taken aback to behold so radiant a patient i fainted cried pixie proudly i never fainted before in all my life i don't remember a single thing after i slipped until i woke up on this sofa indeed and a very sensible arrangement just as well to know nothing about these disagreeable experiences the doctor smiled and fingered her head with a careful touch does that hurt you no does that do you feel any tenderness there a little bit eh you don't like me to press it you probably grazed yourself slightly as you fell and that caused the faint nothing serious though you need not be frightened i like it said pixie stoutly and the burst of laughter with which the two hearers greeted this statement sounded pleasantly in the captain's ears as he dressed himself in the lock-keeper's sunday garments in the room overhead end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain lovers meetings the doctor saw no reason why pixie should not be driven home and offered to order a closed carriage in the village and pending its arrival the adventurers enjoyed another cup of tea not smoked this time and made merry over the change in their appearance wrought by the borrowed clothing pixie's red merino dress was the pride of little miss lockkeeper's heart but about two sizes too big for its present occupant the bodice hung in folds about her tiny figure the sleeves came down to her fingertips the captain's shiny black suit made him appear quite clumsy and awkward 
but that was all part of the fun in the estimation of three members of the party at least mrs wallace was undecided whether to laugh or to cry as she welcomed her truants and listened to the story of their adventures nothing would satisfy her but to dispatch pixie to bed forthwith to that young lady's intense mortification and to order the captain upstairs to have a hot bath and a dose of quinine when he came downstairs she was putting a letter in the post-box in the hall and motioning towards it explained its purport i've been writing to mamzelle's sister in london these lock accidents get into the papers sometimes and are generally exaggerated into something really so thrilling and terrible it's best to tell the true story ourselves and i have brought this trouble upon you i could kick myself for my stupidity you will never trust me again but please make me the scapegoat to the sister and let her wreak her wrath on me it's not fair that you should be blamed oh i am not afraid of any wrath i assure you she's a charming girl and as sweet as mamzelle herself i have asked her to come down to-morrow and see for herself that there is no harm done i thought that was the best way out of the difficulty and please don't blame yourself too much it was an accident and we must just be very very thankful that you were all preserved from harm the next morning the captain took himself off for a long walk ostensibly to call on some friends in reality to avoid meeting the visitor from town for though a man may boldly acknowledge his responsibility and offer to bear the blame he has an instinctive shrinking from the society of females in distress and will walk a very long distance in order to avoid anything like a scene it seemed the height of bad fortune that this particular visitor should arrive in the afternoon instead of in the morning and that he should stumble into the library almost immediately after she had arrived she was seated on an ottoman with her back towards him but mrs wallace's quick exclamation took away any chance of retreating unseen why here he is she cried this is the culprit or the hero whichever you choose to call him come and tell your own story dick this is mademoiselle's sister miss o'shaughnessy but he had recognized her already she had turned her head as mrs wallace spoke and beneath the curving brim of the hat he had seen the face which had been enshrined in his heart for three long years the sweet face which had brought to him at once the greatest joy and the bitterest sorrow of his life he stood still in the middle of the room staring at her as if suddenly turned to stone and bridgie rose to her feet the pretty colour fading out of her cheeks her lips a-tremble with emotion mrs wallace looked from one to the other and with a woman's intuition divined something very nearly approaching the truth dick was quite changed from his old happy self every one had noticed it and speculated as to the cause in his last furlough he had stayed some time in ireland could it be could it possibly be you have met before she said quickly that is very nice you know each other and can talk over yesterday's adventure without my help will you excuse me if i leave you for a few moments while i give some orders to the maids no one answered but she lost no time in hurrying from the room and as the door closed behind her the captain came slowly across the room staring at bridgie's white face miss o'shaughnessy she called you miss o'shaughnessy she shrank before him scared by his strange excited manner yes it is my name i am bridgie o'shaughnessy don't you remember me remember you he repeated with an emphasis which was more eloquent than a hundred protestations 
he seized her hands in a painful pressure you were not married then it was not true you did not marry him as they told me i you thought i was married oh what put such an idea into your head i heard it eighteen months ago shortly after your last letter arrived telling me about your father and hinting at other changes which might follow my friend wrote that miss o'shaughnessy was engaged to a fellow with a lot of money hilliard that they were going to be married almost at once was it all an invention was there no truth in it at all it was quite true quite but it was esmeralda not me she married him over a year ago esmeralda your sister but he said the eldest daughter and you are the eldest i knew i was not mistaken about that for i remember every word you had told me bridgie smiled faintly the colour was coming back into her cheeks and the grey eyes met his with shy incredulous happiness but most people give her the credit for it all the same there's so much more of her you see you never wrote to ask if it were true i was too proud and hurt badly hurt bridgie mortally badly and you never wrote to ask why i was silent were you proud too or contemptuous which was it did you think i was nothing but a flirt and a heartless one at that i never thought unkindly of you but i suppose i was proud for i couldn't write when all the money was gone and i was so poor i thought you had forgotten or met someone else i hoped you were very happy only i wasn't faltered bridgie with a little break in her voice as she spoke that last word which brought the tears to the captain's eyes he bent his head over the clasped hands and kissed them a dozen times over bridgie bridgie he cried brokenly is it true have i found you again after all these years can you forgive me for this wretched blunder which has brought such unhappiness upon us both i am thankful to know you were unhappy too for i had nothing to go on bridgie no claim whatever upon you only you must have guessed how i felt i could not believe that you had really given yourself to me in that short time i couldn't myself said bridgie naively i tried to pretend that it was all a mistake that i was quite happy without you she looked up at him shyly and shook her head in the most beguiling denial twas not a mite of use i remember all the same and are you sure quite sure that you thought of me all the time was there never any one else all these long long years the captain smiled and stroked his moustache in amused contemplative fashion there was never any one except one girl i met one girl who quite stole my heart and i think i stole hers into the bargain oh oh how dreadful why did you tell me but you didn't you never thought of marrying her did you dick i'm not so sure she did he laughed and seized her hands once more no it is too bad i won't tease you it was mamzelle patty darling to whom i confided my story and who comforted me in her own sweet fashion and she is your sister and it is she who has brought us together bridgie if i didn't love you with all my heart i believe i should still have to marry you for nothing else than to be mamzelle's brother but bridgie did not affect to be jealous she threw back her head and smiled happily as she answered i'm thankful to hear you say it for whoever marries me must love pixie too i can never leave her behind me End of chapter thirty one